statements that Jesus made where he said, I am, in the, in the Gospel of John. And uh, maybe some of you are like, yeah, I am the bread of life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the resurrection life. I am the gate? Really? I am the gate? Maybe you're not as familiar with that statement, but to be honest with you, that's one of the ones I find the most fascinating. And uh, hopefully, as uh, we go through this, you'll, you'll understand why. I know um, earlier, early in the month and uh, last month, we spent some Sundays where uh, I said, you know when you're trying to fit something in a jar, you fill it up, and then you shake it, and it settles down a bit, and then you pour some more in, and then you shake it. Uh, we kind of did that concept during church, where uh, I'm going to speak a little bit, and then I'm going to pray, and then I'm going to speak a little bit, and then I'm going to pray, just to help kind of shake it in. It throws some people off. They're like, oh, five minutes, he's done, all right. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, it's not the closing credits yet, so don't... Uh... I'll leave you in ta anticipation. Well, Lord, we thank you for the gift of your word. And Lord, we thank you that your word is always going out throughout the earth. Just like a radio and television signal. And the way we find out is when we turn on the radio and catch the signal or turn on the TV. So, Lord, we have gathered to tune our ear to you, O oh God, to listen to your voice speaking your words of love to us yet again. And so, Lord, we invite you to open the eyes of our heart that we may see you more clearly. Open our ears that we may hear your voice speaking your words of love to us yet again. And Lord, open our hearts that we would trust you, that we would believe you at your word and act upon it. Bless us, Lord, as we listen to you today. We ask in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. You ever have the Lord speak to you and you think, um, that doesn't really sound like words of love? But it is kind of like when your mom turns to you and says, do you really think that's a good idea? You know? It's only because she loves you and she doesn't have to whoop your butt later. So, <laughs> When I was a kid, we used to go to Santa Cruz for vacation a lot. And um, somebody told me, it's kind of like an old ghost story from Santa Cruz from days gone by near the cliffs. There was, a, I don't know if it was an old hotel or a restaurant, but it was closed down and abandoned. And neighbors started complaining to the police that they heard screams echoing from the building in the middle of the night, even though they didn't see anybody and they didn't see any lights in there. And so the police checked it out, didn't see anybody, and they left. And then some complained that they saw children sneaking into the building at night and then heard these terrifying screams and never saw the children come out. And the police searched the building but didn't find a trace of anyone. But because these complaints and, and how frightened the neighbors were, they decided to stake it out and see what was going on for themselves. And what they found were kids were going in with skateboards and they found that the drainage pipes that went from that facility went down through the cliff and dumped out on the beach. And they'd lay on their skateboards and go in pitch black, <laughs> screaming because they're terrified and dump out on the beach. So, kids went in the building but never came out. So. I would imagine there were some cops that are like, thank you, Jesus. <laughs> They had found a secret passage from the top of the cliff to the beach. <laughs> Jesus almost implies here like he is the secret passage to the presence of God. And in the Gospel of John, verse 10, or chapter 10, Jesus says a lot comparing his followers to sheep. He's not implying we're stupid, but <laughs> what he's implying is that the shepherd is the one who leads the sheep. The shepherd is the one who protects the sheep. The shepherd is the one who cares for the sheep. And so he talks about himself as the shepherd and we are the sheep. But then he changes and uses a different kind of illustration. He uses something very different in verses 7 through 9. He says this, Therefore Jesus said again, Very truly I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep. 
All who have come before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep have not listened to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. They will come in and go out and find pasture. So Jesus describes himself as a gateway to the presence of God. And he's not just talking about when we die. A lot of people, they think following Jesus has nothing to do with this life here. It's just fire insurance to keep you out of hell someday after you die. And yet our eternal life in God's presence begins the day we said yes to Jesus. And if it was talking about heaven, what would he mean by verse 9? They come in and they go out. What, you're not dressed nice enough or what? <laughs> right? So if it, it's not just talking about heaven. How does that work? How, what does that mean that Jesus is the gate and his followers will come in and go out? Lord, as we look to this today, we invite you to uh, grant us your understanding. Because Lord, you are not just the author of our faith, but the perfecter of our faith. And so, Lord, let us see you more clearly as we look to your word. We ask in your name. Amen. 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 Well, let me tell you a bit about what Scripture calls the heavenly realms, or the heavens. You ever notice it's plural? The heavens? Like, there's several of them. And, and to be honest, as a kid, I was confused because they said, where's heaven? They said, oh, it's up there. Right? I'm like, okay, so if hell's down there, the Australians are doomed, right? Because <laughs> that's up to them, <laughs> you know? So I was a very cerebral little kid, always trying to figure out the physics of how God worked. In 2 Corinthians 12, 2, the Apostle Paul says, I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago was caught up to the third heaven. Whether it was in the body or out of body, I do not know, but God knows. And more people like, the third heaven? What, like there's a good neighborhood and a bad neighborhood and a gated neighborhood or what? You know. But it, it talks, Scripture talks about the heavenly realm in a couple of different ways. And I'm going to try not to make this sound too much like Star Trek. <laughs> but the Bible describes at least three types of heavenly realm. And the first one is what you and I and what society recognizes. That it's... The sky and space, the sun, the moon, the stars. And, uh, and it is referred to the, he the heavens. Psalm 19 verse 1 says, The heavens declare the glory of God, the skies proclaim the work of His hands. It, it's talking about the stars, the planets. People look and they marvel and they say there's just too much balance and it defies the laws of physics that it even exists. Well, something that kind of blew my mind was I found out science tells us that there is a fabric to space, and space can be bent. And again, if you watch a lot of Star Trek, they talk about space being torn. This, the jury is still out on that as far as uh, the scientific community goes. But they said it, it's like space was a fabric, and God wedged some planets in there. Imagine if we stretched a big sheet out, and you tossed a heavy ball in the middle, and so it sagged down. They said that's what matter or planets due to space. And so if you have a bug or a mouse trying to cross the sheet and they get too close to where the ball is, they'll fall in. That's how basically how gravity works for us. It's more like we are just going with the bend in space that our planet did. So it took me a while to just kind of wrap my head around this, that, that space isn't just nothing. It's like God's canvas that he painted creation onto. So, as a kid, I'd think, so what's on the other side of the fabric, right? What is on the other side of the curtain, so to speak? Well, in the Gospel of Mark, chapter 1, verse 10, when Jesus was baptized, it says, just as Jesus was coming up out of the water, he saw heaven being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. It wasn't that a dove just happened to be there. It said the Spirit came down on Jesus like a dove. But what Mark says is the heavens were torn open. And the word used there in the Greek is schizo, which means a violent tearing. So it wasn't like, you know, the opening to The Simpsons. Oh, you know, it was 
It, it was a violent rending of space, and the Spirit descended on Jesus. Amen. Which brings us to our second definitions of the heavens, which is the kind of like the, the dimension of God's presence. Because again, as a kid, I'm watching the Apollo astronauts, and they're way up there. It's like, you see heaven? <laughs> no, but it is spectacular from up here. But the demand, God is outside of our space and time, so to speak. Again, it's like the artist is not a part of the canvas that he's painting. He owns the canvas. He works with it. But it, it's just a part of his existence. And this is what Paul was talking about in 2 Corinthians 12, verse 2. Where he said, uh, he knows a man, and some scholars think he's talking about himself. He just doesn't want to come right out and say it. Knows a man who was caught up to the presence of heaven. And we also might refer to this as the spirit realm. Because John chapter 4, verse 24 tells us that God is spirit. And when you read in the book of Revelation, which a lot of people are reading these days because lots of crazy stuff is happening, chapters 4 and 5 are this whole scene of God's presence in heaven. And John talks about the, the angelic beings that are around and the cherubim were a whole different kind of angelic being uh, surrounding the throne of God. And, and there's this description of what it is like before the presence of God, and it isn't a place that you can just drive to, but God brings you there. You know, there's other passages that talk about something like a tear in the fabric of space. Isaiah 34, verse 4, in talking about the end, says, All the stars in the sky will be dissolved, and the heavens rolled up like a scroll. Like God says, okay, we're done with that. All the starry hosts will fall like withered leaves from the vine, like shriveled figs from the fig tree. And again in Revelation chapter 6, verses 14 through 16, it says, The heavens receded like a scroll being rolled up, and every mountain and island was removed from its place. Then the kings of the earth, the princes, the generals, the rich, the mighty, and everyone else, both slave and free, hid in caves and among the rocks of the mountains. They called to the mountains and the rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. When you read in scripture where people are suddenly in the presence of God, they're struck with terror because nothing is more powerful than God and they usually fall down and, um, and they're terrified. To be honest, we see a little hint of that when we try to get people from East Stockton to come to church. They're afraid, I have not lived a worthy life. I'm not going to walk into God's presence. So imagine if the fabric of space was torn and we could see God's presence right there. That's where they would want to hide in caves and ask the mountain to fall on them because they don't want to face God. Lord Jesus, again, help us wrap our mind around what you are talking about. Help us understand in a greater way, and Lord, not just to satisfy our curiosity, but so that we may know you better and have a better worldview to help you seek and save the lost, just like you seeked and saved us. Lord, bless us, we ask in your name. Amen. Amen. Well, there's another dimension of the spirit realm talked about in Scripture, and it's Basically, the demonic realm. It's the, the, an area of darkness where the demonic comes from. Uh, the Apostle Paul says in Ephesians 6.12, For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. We just don't want to go there. We don't want to tear that open. <laughs> And let the let the animals out, so to speak. I um, when Chip Jones and I went and visited Walt and Janine White in Bangladesh, um, they told their dining room had metal ceiling fans, and they said every now and then bats get in here. <laughs> and we said, "Wow, what do you do?" 
said, well, we close all the doors, turn on the ceiling fans, and get our tennis rackets. <laughs> and our friend Manuel, I looked at him, I said, we got to get some bats in here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, nah, you don't want to open the doors and let the bats in. But to be honest, every time we choose to disobey God and, and commit sin, we are a gateway for the demonic to enter the world. You know, the devil doesn't kill people. He whispers in people's ears telling them to kill people. And then they choose to obey him or not. So we're not going to focus on that realm today. We want to go back to what Jesus said, where he said he is the gate where we have access to God. Imagine reading in Revelation 4 and 5 about the throne room of God and thinking we have access to that. Like Jesus is our secret passage to go in and talk to God and to dwell in his presence. Not just when we die, but every day of our lives. When Jesus first began his ministry, he told a man who became his disciple, Nathaniel, in John 1, verse 51, he says this, Very truly I tell you, you will see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Talking about himself. Which was actually an image out of Genesis when Jacob was in the middle of nowhere and laid down to, have a, to, to get a night's sleep in the wilderness. And he was afraid, he'd been fleeing for his life. And he had a dream where the heavens were open and the angels of God were ascending and descending. And he said, this is the house of God. This is the gateway to heaven, and I didn't even know it. Jesus said, that's what you're going to see, the angels of God ascending and descending on me, because he is the gate. You know, in Mark's gospel, there were two things that were violently ripped open. One was the heavens so that the Spirit could descend on Jesus as a dove. And at the other end of the gospel of Mark... The curtain in the temple that separated the, the most holy place of the Holy of Holies where the presence of God was supposed to be, that curtain was violently torn in half, not by any person, but by God. And the curtain represented the barrier between us and God. The, the death of Jesus on the cross opened the gateway so that we could be in the presence of God. Hebrews chapter 8, verse 5, says the temple is a copy and shadow of what is in heaven. Just like uh, kids who build a model airplane, that's not the real airplane. But it looks a lot like it, and they can learn a lot of details about it by the model. When God told Moses to build the tabernacle, it was patterned off of things in heaven. And Jesus' death on the cross ripped open the barrier, giving you and I access to the presence of God. And if we're afraid we are too dirty and too unrighteous to do it, the blood of Jesus has cleansed us from all unrighteousness. And so scripture describes it that we are in Christ and that's how we get through. I remember uh, my dad and I, we went backpacking in Yosemite years ago. And before we rounded the corner to go in the gate to get into Yosemite, there were some backpackers hitchhiking. And we had a pickup truck. Back then you could ride in the back of a pickup well, they're hitchhiking, so they don't have to pay the entrance fee. <laughs> so we let them in our backpack, and we drove through the gate, paid for our truck, went around a corner, and they all hopped out, <laughs> right? When you are in Christ, He is the gate, and you have access to the presence of God. It's not a scam. He loves you. He provided that way for you. Amen. He, again, in Hebrews, that explains a lot about this, chapter 10, verses 19 through 22 says this, Therefore, brothers and sisters, scissors? <laughs> Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way opened for us through the curtain, that is, his body, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, talking about Jesus, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and with the full assurance that faith brings, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. Amen. 
Jesus is the gate that we have access to God. Again, in Hebrews chapter 4, verses 14 and 16, says this, Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has gone through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess, and let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. You might recognize that. A lot of times I open our time of worship talking about as we approach God's throne of grace in our time of need, we invite Him to pour out His Holy Spirit and do whatever He wants. And the thing is, it's not just about you and I having access and telling the rest of the world, sorry, sucks for you, you know. No. We are called to help set the prisoners free, to storm the very gates of hell. And a lot of you all... Whatever God pulled you out of, your mind is on those who are still left behind. And it's like, I know the passage to get to God. Let me introduce you to Jesus. He is the gate. You give your life to Jesus, you have access to God, and you no longer need to be afraid. Jesus is the gate, and the glory of God shines through it. This is why Jesus said in John chapter 3, verse 3, No one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. And again, I don't think he's talking about heaven. He says in verses 5 and 6, Very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and the Spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but Spirit gives birth to Spirit. So the day you said yes to Jesus and gave your life to Him, you became spiritually alive, spiritually born again, and when you kneel in prayer, your spirit goes into the presence of God in Christ. You have access to the throne room of God. And when God looks at you, he does not say, how do you get in here? No, he says, ah, oh, my beloved son, my beloved daughter. Oh God, we marvel at the way you have granted us access. And Lord, this is not for our entertainment, but it's so that we will have life and life to the full. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you pointed to each and every person here and said, come, follow me. And when we responded to that call, we are now in Christ. God, it blows our mind that you have given us access to the throne room of our loving Heavenly Father. And Lord, it's not just for our own entertainment, it's not just for our salvation, but you have amazing, marvelous things in store for us. Bless us, Lord, as we continue to explore your good plans for each and every one of us. We ask in your name. Amen. 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 Jesus is the gate. If you've surrendered your life to him, you are in Christ. Through Jesus, you have access to the kingdom of God, the heavenly realm. It, Paul said in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 6, And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with Him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. That's past tense, not future tense, that he's talking about. One time when Will was, I don't know, I don't think he had started school yet, or he might have been in kindergarten, I took him with me to the state police memorial up in Sacramento where they honor the families and all the fallen officers during that time. And um, it was right by the Court of Appeals uh, building. And they had the lobby open so people could use the restroom. So Will and I go in there because, you know, there's marble and there's columns and cool stuff for a little boy to see and explore. And we're, I'm looking through the crack in the door where the appeals court is. I said, see this? This is the kind of place mommy goes to work. And the janitor walks up and he goes, you want to see it? He pulls out his keys and unlocks it and we go in, right? So there's a big chair in the middle and a couple of smaller chairs and then there's the bar. you got to pass the bar to be able to cross and go in and... I go, well, go sit in the big chair. <laughs> Snap a couple of pictures. Back in the old days when you had film and cameras, you might remember that, yeah. Got a process, showed it to Paula. Didn't tell her what it was until she saw it. Oh, well, I can't believe you got, I can't even go there. And that, there you are sitting on the head guy's chair. 
God raised us up and seated us with Christ, with Him in the heavenly realms. You have access. And what did Jesus tell us when He taught us to pray? Because it's not just about suffer here and when you die you'll have relief and be in God's kingdom. No, when they asked Jesus, Lord, teach us to pray, part of what He taught them to pray is, God, your kingdom come and your will be done on earth just as it is done in heaven. He told us to ask that. That God's kingdom would come down to earth. What does that look like? Well, what is it like before God's throne in heaven? There's no hate. There's no pain. There's no fear. There's no cancer. There's no diabetes. There's no sickness at all. There's no depression. There's just unspeakable peace and joy. This is what we ask God to do. And you know what? When we pray, this is what we bring into our world. When we pray, God, let your kingdom come, let your will be done right here on earth, just like it is before your throne in heaven. We have access to the throne of God, and through Jesus... The kingdom of God comes through to where we are now. We, like Jesus said, my sheep, they come in, they go out. What does this look like? Let me give you an example. Last Thursday at noon, our CSI team went to Knickerbocker Court where a 30-year-old man was shot and killed. We never quite know what's waiting there for us. There have been a couple of places where people said, uh, we don't want you here. And they told us to leave. There are some people who are like, oh yeah, you can pray here. And we found out later they had guns and were guarding the house. That was interesting. <laughs> but we never really know what we're walking up to. But we do know we are going to the place of violence and inviting the kingdom of God to touch down in that place. <laughs> and so as we approach, we see a gathering of Samoans that were in the front yard. And of course, it's a court, so the only people that go in there are the families, and all of a sudden, all these people who aren't Samoans show up and start parking their cars and gathering. And so, we walked over and told them that we had come to pray for their family and for their neighborhood, and they invited us to come up in their yard, and they had a table with uh, flowers and candles and photos of the man who was killed, and there was also a young man, I think he's an 18-year-old, who was also shot in this event. And one of the men asked me if I was the pastor, and he introduced himself as Pastor Via. And they said, go ahead. And they gathered with us, and we prayed. And, and you know, we didn't shout, we didn't hoop and holler. I know God's old, but he's not hard of hearing, <laughs> you know. But we just prayed that God would bless, take the ground that was cursed by the shedding of innocent blood and break the curse by the blood of Jesus. And that God would breathe new life into this family and, and give them hope and, and set a joy before them that they can endure this time of unspeakable grief and pain. And then we ended our time with communion. There were 12 of us gathered in a circle to share communion together, remembering the body and blood of Jesus broken for us. And then uh, Donna makes these homemade crosses and we always leave one at the site hoping somebody will steal it and wear it and to have a reminder of hope. And Donna gave one to the mother-in-law of the man who was slain and then left another one on the table, the mementos, so that for the next weeks and months and maybe years she can say, oh, we're not alone. There's brothers and sisters across our city that are praying for us just as a reminder of hope. And then before we left, Pastor Via gave us an envelope. He said, please accept this gift on our behalf. And I'm thinking, you guys need all the money you can get. And yet, Rose is laughing at me because I'm always preaching about this. You've got to learn to graciously receive it. Because what he's doing is giving an offering to Jesus. He's not giving it to me. It's in the offering box back there in the back now. It was an incredible time of prayer, worship, fellowship, and everybody there knew that our time with them 
was a sacred gift from God. When we left there, all I wanted to do was go somewhere and be alone and cry and pray. Because it was so amazing what God did in that time. Jesus said something that I didn't understand for a while in Matthew 11, verse 12. He said this, From the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of, of heaven has suffered violence, and the violent take it by force. You know what that means? It means we go through the gate, we grab the presence of God, and drag it down. To, we're not going to sit around and wait passively. We're not going to sit as our, our neighbors are devastated and say, oh, Jesus, help them. No, we take the presence of God. We take us in Christ and Christ in us, and we go to the dark places. And we pray, God, let your kingdom come. Let your will be done. The kingdom of heaven has suffered violence, and the violence take it by force. What does that mean? It means Jesus left the gate open. And we are raiding heaven. We have access to the throne of grace, pulling the kingdom of God through the gate into our world. That's what we do when we pray. And when I say by violence, I mean we're pushing our way. I don't mean we got to shout at God and threaten her. That, that's human violence. It's different with God. But that's what we do when we pray. That's what we do when we bring the light of Christ into the dark places. We didn't go to that family's home yelling and hollering. We didn't demand anything. But we went to the place of violence and through Jesus pulled the kingdom of God into that front yard. After our time of prayer together, nobody was afraid. They weren't afraid of us and we weren't afraid of them. We were very aware of the love of God in that place even though we didn't know these people and we'd never met them before. And we shared the same hope that we have found after violence in our own lives. And because everybody there was born again, we could see the kingdom of God right there in Knickerbocker Court, the most unexpected of places. Jesus is the gate. You have access to the throne room of God. He has invited you to pull the realities of heaven through the gate and into our world. Let me ask you, will you violently raid the kingdom of God and pull it into our world? <clears throat> will you take the light of Christ into the dark places? Some of us go out feeding the homeless and praying with people in the Mormon slough and the diverting canal and behind the liquor store in different places. Some of us go out at noon and pray. Some of you have given the hope of Christ to co-workers and prayed with them, with neighbors, with classmates. Whatever opportunity God gives you, when you see it, that's God's invitation for you to enter it. And again, you don't have to leap, you don't have to shout, you don't have to pray in King James English. You just talk to God. If you come on movie night, it's it's. Amazing how unspectacular their prayer life is when they go into the violent places, but it's effective. You have access. Jesus told you, violently pull the presence of God and his kingdom into our community. God, you are amazing. <clears throat> and Lord, so many of us are just thrilled that we have access to you. And yet, Lord, it's humbling to know that it's not just that. It's not just about us, but it's about others who are still locked behind the gates of hell. And Lord, you told us to storm the gates and set the captives free. Which means that in the name of Jesus, with love and kindness and compassion, we go into the hateful and dark and violent places. And we bring your presence. We're not making a show, Lord. Because, well, we're not making a show of ourselves, but we want to make a show of you. We want you to be glorified in those places, Lord. So that we can literally go to the scene of the crime, and at the, when everything is said and done, people will say, God is surely in this place. 
Because, Lord, you are amazing. And your plan is always multi-level. And God, it just blows my mind that you invite us to be a part of this grand adventure that you have called us to. Lord Jesus, thank you that you are the gate. You are the access to the realm of God. And you have opened the gate to us that we may come and go, that we may go into God's presence, take hold of God, and then walk through our world bringing the kingdom of God with us. God, you are a marvel and a wonder. And God, eternal life in you was just the beginning. Walking with you each and every day and watching you work around us is a marvel to watch. Lord, how amazing it is that your perfect love drives out all fear. So Lord, perfect your love in us so that when we see a situation, we say, I don't know, this could be embarrassing, or I don't know, this could really hurt, that your perfect love will overpower those fears so that we will go there and bring your kingdom with us. Lord, thank you to this life that you have called us to. It is a marvelous adventure, and we get to see your salvation work up close and personal. And God, it's humbling to know that for some reason, you let us be part of the plan. You have invited us to be your co-workers to bring salvation to a lost and hurting world. Lord Jesus, thank you. You are the way and the truth and the life. You are the gate. And through you, we enter his presence with thanksgiving in our hearts and his courts with praise. Lord, you've been really good to us. And we thank you that because we are here and still alive and breathing, you've got yet more adventure for us. Lord, thank you for letting us hang out with you. Thank you for letting us come to the very throne room of God, even right now. Lord, we thank you for all these things. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 amen.